The Dance Edit podcast is brought to you by Jackrabbit Dance. Jackrabbit is the industry's most reliable dance studio management software. If you're a studio owner, you know how important class management software is. Jackrabbit is going to make your life so much easier. Their software is cloud-based, powerful, and adaptable. And Jackrabbit has the industry's largest team of trainers, product coaches, and client success specialists to support you in your studio. You wouldn't accept less than the best from your students. Don't accept it from your software either. Visit jackrabbitdance.com and use the promo code DANCEMEDIA, all one word, for a free trial. dance friends and welcome to the dance edit podcast i'm margaret fuhrer i'm courtney Escoyne, and i'm lydia murray we are editors at dance media and in today's episode we will be talking about the cancellation of so many major holiday dance shows from nutcrackers to the radio city christmas spectacular and what those cancellations mean for the affected institutions discussing la dance projects cannily timed repositioning of itself as not just a dance company but also a lifestyle brand touching on some of the non-dance hobbies and habits that dancers are finding comfort in during the pandemic, and hearing from Alejandro Duque Cifuentes, the executive director of Dance NYC. Um, but first, a friendly reminder that we are more than just a podcast. Are you getting our Daily Dance Digest email yet? Because every weekday, the Dance Edit newsletter gets you up to speed on the day's top dance news stories, gives you a quote of the day to ponder, and then sends you off with a parting shot, aka a beautiful dance photo or video. And it's built actually a solid following in its year and change of existence. So we hope you'll come along for that ride with us by signing up at thedanceedit.com. And if you are enjoying us in this podcast form, please let us know by rating and reviewing and subscribing on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or your listening platform of choice. We're on all of them. Okay, now it's time for our weekly dance headline rundown because a lot of newsy news came out of the dance world this past week. Lydia, will you start us off? A recent study by Dance Data Project revealed that men still choreograph 72% of ballets. Not surprised. Uh, The West End and UK touring productions of The Phantom of the Opera have closed without fanfare. The London production had been running for 34 years. The popular character shoe brand LaDuca Shoes recently released the LaDuca Palette, which offers shoes in four new shades for BIPOC dancers. And Disney Plus announced plans to adapt Once on This Island into a movie. Now, to be clear, this will be a feature film movie musical as opposed to a taped performance like we saw with Hamilton. But hopefully we'll still get Camille Brown's choreography. Please, Fingers please, crossed. Please, please, please. Hope so. Yes. The MTV Video Music Award nominees have arrived. The nominees for Best Choreography include Kyle Hanagami, Sean Bankhead, Richie Jackson, and as the resident BTS fan here at Dance Media, I have to mention that the choreography for their song On received a nomination officially credited by MTV to The Lab and Son Sung Duk. So you'll notice that with the exception of the Phantom Closure, cancellation announcements were sort of eerily absent from that list. And I wish that were because there were no other cancellations to report, but Actually, it's because we'll be addressing most of that news in our next segment. Even though it's only August, we have already seen the cancellation of what feels like every holiday dance show out there. There's been a slew of bad Nutcracker news. Um, The Washington Ballet, Colorado Ballet, and Atlanta Ballet are three of the latest companies to cancel their productions. And on Tuesday, Madison Square Garden announced that for the first time since 1933, there would be no Radio City Christmas Spectacular, no Rockettes this year. There's just too much pandemic-related uncertainty still for these organizations to commit to such large-scale performances. So let's talk a little about what a holiday season without holiday shows is actually going to mean, because the repercussions could be massive. So the Washington Ballet announced the postponement of its 2020 season at the end of July. Colorado Ballet announced its uh, the cancellation of its 2020 Nutcracker. Atlanta Ballet canceled the Nutcracker this year. Um, and companies like New York City Ballet and Joffrey and Pennsylvania Ballet have already canceled their Nutcrackers. And all of these productions stand to lose millions of dollars in ticketing revenue as a result, which, of course, has serious implications for the futures of these organizations. Yeah, it's no secret that Nutcracker is frequently the show that funds the rest of a company's season. Um, And ballet company budgets are already hurting from the loss of revenue from the spring and the summer. 
you know, canceling nut is the safe, sane, responsible thing to do here. But, you know, there's no doubt about that. But I dread to think what this means uh, for the future of these organizations. Uh, I mean, a Nutcracker is also huge, you know, not only for the young dancers participating and for up and coming company dancers who get to cut their teeth on soloist roles. Um, but what about the pros who supplement their income by guesting? A lot of them make a lot of additional income in this period of time. And these holiday shows like the Nutcracker have been such a huge part of most of these dancers' lives and careers from a young age and what emotional um, impact will that have? Yeah. And we should also note that the, the news from MSG, it wasn't just that the Radio City Christmas Spectacular was being canceled. It's also that they were laying off, I think, 350 employees. So already the financial implications of these cancellations are significant. Um, oh, and also uh, the, the Washington Ballet lost its executive director. That came in the same breath as the Nutcracker cancellation, which it seems like wasn't entirely due to financial issues, but at least in part is because they just aren't going to have the funds in their budget this year. And it's also a bit of a nerve wracking time, I think, for an organization to lose an executive director simply because so much of what their job has to do is budgeting. Somebody's hand has to be on the tiller. Yeah. Um, I think that for a long time, there was this hope that the pandemic would kind of be a blip on the dance world's radar rather than the beginning of a sea change. But the truth is that that sea change has actually been coming for a while. Um, old business models relying on huge productions like these holiday shows were becoming less and less sustainable, especially in the United States. And that leads us to our next segment in which we'd like to discuss the way Benjamin Millipier's company, LA Dance Project, has been reinventing itself. I would say quietly reinventing itself, but recently there's actually been a lot of not very quiet news coverage on its evolution. Um, Millipia and his colleagues are opening up new revenue streams by turning LADP into a whole lifestyle brand. They're offering fitness classes and pay-per-view virtual performances through this new LADP digital platform. Yeah, so um, LA Dance Project has launched an app that allows users to take dance classes with members of the company and high-profile guest teachers. And it also offers access to virtual pay-per-view performances and behind-the-scenes rehearsal content. The app is free, but access to the classes is $9.99 per month. And it was created and released in less than two months. But it's designed to be permanent. Uh, it's, it's partially an effort to avoid layoffs, but also this can help the company to take risks, continue to take risks artistically by reducing reliance on traditional ballet patrons. Um, first, I just want to say that I think this is a really innovative, great idea. Um, I would love to see more dance companies uh, being in a position to take similar approaches. I'm not sure if it's a viable option for a lot of companies at this time, uh, just because it can be expensive to create this sort of project. And uh, LADP has a unique amount of kind of mainstream star power and connections that I'm not sure every company has access to. Um, but for a long time, I've really wanted to see more dance companies kind of embracing other opportunities for generating revenue, uh, kind of thinking more outside the box, um, borrowing from startup culture um, in a way that's um, interesting and profitable, but also healthy for everyone involved at the company. And I think it's worth noting that like this whole lifestyle brand route, I don't think is really a like it's not a knee jerk reaction to the pandemic. Right. Um, LA Dance Project has kind of been making noise about doing this sort of thing in different ways for a couple of years now. They have a really um, rather high profile donor base, which I guess is what happens when your artistic director is married to an Oscar winning actress. Mm -hmm. Natalie Portman, <laughs> just to clarify. Yes. Um, but you know, like, I think the timing of this has turned out to be wildly fortuitous. And I think it is interesting that it isn't necessarily just dance dance things in here. Like they have a video that is book recommendations from Mikhail Baryshnikov. So there's that dance connection, but it's not like explicitly dancey. Yeah. When I was first reading about this, my first thought was, oh, it's dance goop. That's what this sounds like. Are, like, are they going to start <laughs> making product recommendations next? That seems like kind of a natural next step, which is fascinating. Also kind of raises some red flags for me. I'm not going to lie. I think it probably might raise red flags for a lot of other people. It's definitely not a traditional move. And um I have sometimes I worry that in the dance community, we can kind of worry a bit too much about 
the appearance of overemphasizing the commercial aspect of what we do um, or the appearance of, for lack of a better term, I guess, selling out or that kind of thing. Well, I think there's something interesting here about, like you mentioned startup culture, Lydia, which is in and of itself a culture that oftentimes does not center or prioritize the people doing the work. Um which is something that I think is unfortunately also somewhat prevalent in the dance world is oftentimes dancers are treated as disposable. Um, that being said, it's interesting because I feel like they're making a lot of noise about having their dancers wearing all these different hats when I think that's something that dancers already kind of do in a lot of ways, just more quietly. And so... I don't like it's it's an interesting conundrum where it's okay so is this like kind of taking advantage of them is this um like should we be having these icky red flags or is it like oh they're just kind of like turning something that's already been underlying the way that dance companies run and instead of making it subtext they're making it a feature text Mm -hmm. yeah yeah yeah, I know. I've been trying to analyze my own reactions to this, too, and and figure out if they're coming out of just my experience in a system that is fundamentally broken. The the things that it's taught us to value aren't necessarily the most valuable things. Um, I mean, I guess sort of the dream for this kind of system is that the dance company itself would be sort of the loss leader, like the prestige engine that then drives this revenue generating machine but that it would benefit financially from that extra revenue, which would allow it to take more artistic risks. Right. Yeah, I completely agree with Courtney's concerns. But I do hope that as long as the dancers are, you know, benefiting from this financially themselves, um, I think it's the equivalent. It's basically a a brand extension, I think. I mean, LADP is nothing if not marketing aware. (laughs) Yeah. So and I don't know that there's necessarily anything wrong with that. Um, I think Mm. that that I'm not saying that like it's a bad thing. It's just a fact. (laughs) Yeah, no, no. I, I just, I feel, I, I again, I just, uh, I'm a little bit worried that sometimes anything related to marketing can kind of signal these alarms in people's minds because it's, you know, such a controversial field. Um, but then at the same time, there's this whole concept of selling out, and it just feeds into the whole starving artist concept and exactly. how you're not a real artist unless you're willing to suffer for your art. And it's like that comes mm-hmm. from such a like messed up and also very privileged place. Anyway, I have a, I have. I could spend the whole rest of the episode ranting about how this is actually like a harmful thing, but I'm not going to. <laughs> yeah, no, I completely agree. I think that's one problem that uh, is kind of pervasive in concert dance culture or maybe dance culture uh, more broadly than that. Um, this idea that you have to suffer for your art or that your legitimacy as an artist is somehow connected to your capacity to withstand hardship. Yeah, especially since that's a mindset that's basically beaten into dancers from the beginning of their training anyway. So all dancers are prone to think that way. Absolutely. It sounds like this is a smart and savvy move for the company. And I'm just so curious to see where where they end up. Where are they going to be a year from now? How is this model going to apply after the pandemic in a post-pandemic world? What will that look like for the company? Mm. So... The future is so hazy for so many dancers. Questions about are their companies going to fold after losing that important holiday season revenue? Or are their future protect professional dance contracts going to include clauses about leading fitness classes for the company's app? What will that mean for them? What is the dance landscape going to look like a month from now or a year from now? Um, and that uncertainty is a huge stress. That means that, as we've talked about before in the podcast, looking after your mental health has never been more important And in our next segment, we want to discuss an article that Dance Magazine published this week, highlighting the ways uh, seven top dancers are practicing self-care during quarantine and looking specifically at the things outside of dance that are bringing them comfort right now. Yeah, I mean, so as uh, Joanne LaFleche pointed out at the beginning of this article, dancers have a tendency to link their identities to being dancers, which makes this strange time we're in where we haven't been in the studio together and we haven't been rehearsing together or performing together exceptionally fraught. And that's on top of the, like, you know, global pandemic and everything else that everyone is dealing with right now. So, like, it's fully okay and valid if you're struggling and if you're having a hard time with that. Um And so I think a lot of what 
the benefit of this article is it's just talking to seven pros about like, this is where I'm finding comfort right now. And it ranges from uh, Leo Zelenska saying that she's kind of indulging in things that remind her of her home in Poland to um, Jared Grimes is writing screenplays right now <laughs> to um, really investing in your morning daily ritual um, or cooking or gardening. And I think there's something really lovely about uh, seeing these extremely high performing dancers talking about these things that aren't about dance and attaching themselves to their identity outside of just being a dancer. Yeah, I do like this, the idea that you could use this quarantine moment to try to create that balanced life that a lot of dance artists are just too busy most of the time to manage. Um, and then hopefully that sense of balance will stick around once your regular schedules resume. Um, that said, <laughs> I have to say, reading the story, a part of me was like, oh, please, I hope we don't turn this into a new kind of performance pressure as as dancers are wont mm. to do. Like, who has the coolest quarantine hobby? I, but it sounds like these are all things that truly bring these dancers peace and joy that they're not something performative, which was the key to the article. Yeah, well, and I think and I think it's also worth noting because it's been all over Twitter for the last however many months we've been in quarantine. I've lost track. Time is fake. But... <laughs> Uh, I think there's definitely this certain attitude of like, you have to pick up this new cool hobby while you were in quarantine, or you have to get really good at baking bread, or you should write that novel you've been saying you were going to work on. And I think there's all this like pressure for that. But it's also like, hey, if you're just like getting up and taking a shower and making something decent to eat for yourself, and that's all you've like accomplished today, that's amazing. Like surviving right now is amazing. So, like, please don't turn this into a weird competition thing. I know, like, dancer competitive brain wants to do that. I get it. I do it. But give yourself a break, guys. Be gentle with yourselves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that was so loaded, Lydia. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was just I was just thinking about how that's so much easier said than done. And I really hope that people actually do. Uh, take the, take that approach and and can be gentle with themselves. Um, but I do agree that there's something really subtly powerful about just seeing these high profile dancers sharing what else they're interested in other than dance, because I think it's so easy to, especially when you're um, when you're kind of more of an up and coming dancer, to feel like you have to make dance define you. And if you uh, spend too much time doing other things, then maybe you're not dedicated enough or you you know, could be spending that time doing some other more directly dance related things. So I think that articles like this are just great to have, um, to put it pretty simply. So now we have the next installment in our voice memo series. Um, each week, we are asking a dancer or a dance leader to leave a, a message for the dance community talking about what they're working on, what they're thinking about, and what's inspiring them right now in their own words. So this week, we have a message from Alejandra Duque Cifuentes, the executive director of Dance NYC. Uh, Alejandra is a former dancer. She performed with Sacco Dance Theater and Bandaloop, among other groups. Now she is an activist and producer and educator and the work that she's doing at Dance NYC, I mean, it's always been invaluable, but over the past few months during the pandemic and the protests, the organization has really felt like a guiding light for dance artists, um, both in New York and well beyond New York. Here she is. Hello, Dance Edit listeners. My name is Alejandra Duque Cifuentes, and I am the executive director of Dance NYC. Since the pandemic hit, Dance NYC has had one main goal. How can we reduce the gap between dance workers and what they need to survive and thrive in this moment? And really that has guided all of the things that we've done from disseminating relief funds to freelance dance workers and organizations to weekly advocacy calls where any member of the community can come together and ask questions and share resources to our calls and legislative letters to our city, state, and federal officials. This moment has been a time where we've put all of our work in the hands of the artists and all of our energy in supporting them. 
We've also hosted a weekly series titled Artists Are Necessary Workers, because one of the things that has really surfaced is how in our city and federal and state government spaces, um, there is a question on whether artists are really needed. Our work has disappeared. Our forms of income have disappeared. And we keep being put back further and further in what reopening could mean. And really in ensuring that dance workers are getting what they need to survive this moment. And so this campaign and, and these conversations have been centered around artists as necessary workers, as a dignified workforce, dance workers, whether it's the individual dancer or the administrator sitting behind a desk, that all of the members of our workforce are important for the reimagining of the future, for even how we've survived through the pandemic, the way in which members of the community and even just the city at large have turned to their screens to enjoy art, to take classes, arts educators, busy at work supporting students. And so we know that artists and we know that the artistic community has time and time again been what has revitalized our cities, what has allowed us to preserve our humanity. And so for us at Dance NYC, the focus has been how can we ensure that our workforce is supported? How can we ensure that people have what they need? Um, and this has meant everything from money in the hands of those that need it, but also in having conversations about what hasn't been working and what didn't work even before COVID arrived. And how can we seize this opportunity that we have to really address the systemic inequities, the presence of white supremacy, the ways in which racism manifests in our organizations and how we work and what we curate in who gets a job and who doesn't and whose job disappears first when a pandemic arrives and whose doesn't. And so positioning dance, positioning arts, positioning our community as vital parts of how we will reimagine the future has been an important component of our work. For me, as a dance worker myself, I've spent the pandemic working in my Regal Park, Queens studio apartment in my kitchen table. And it's been interesting to navigate what it means when work is in conversation with our lives. And in many ways, when we are working and living from the same space and when we think about what the impact of this moment is, for me, it's not just the impact of an industry, of a sector, of the millions of dollars lost and the millions of jobs that have dissipated, but it's also of the family, of the dance worker with their child, of the couple that are navigating whether or not they have enough to eat this month, the artists that are figuring out if they can rehearse on the floor that their apartment allows them to. And so it's a new time. It's a new time and a new opportunity to reimagine what does it mean for us to be a part of our city and a part of our society. When I think about what inspires me right now and when I think about the people whose work have been bringing joy and bringing life, I think of people like Sidney Mosley, who not only is constantly sharing resources and truth on, on her Instagram feed and on her networks, but also bringing us through this beautiful journey of watching her tomato plants grow on her fire escape. I think about Brinda Guha and Wise Fruit. I think about Candace Thompson Zachary. I think about Camille Brown. I think about Stephanie Acosta, how she's organizing abolitionist reading groups. And so, I think about how our community, even as it's reimagining what does it mean to be a dance artist when we can't be in contact with one another, is sharing of the gems of life, of what it means to be in conversation with this moment and with our community. And so as we look to the future, we encourage the dance community to stay connected to each other. We're going to need one another. We're going to need to refuse to go back to the habits that led us here. And we're going to need, above all, to dance. Thank you so much, Alejandra, for sharing that with us. 
Um, please, we encourage you all to visit dance.nyc to find out about the Artists Are Necessary Worker series and all the other great work that Dance NYC is doing. We'll make sure to include a bunch of those links in the episode description. Okay, thanks everyone for joining us. We will be back next week for more discussion of the news that's moving the dance world. Uh, in the meantime, keep learning, keep advocating, and keep dancing. Mind how you go, friends. Bye, everyone. The Dance Edit Podcast is a product of Dance Media, publisher of Dance Magazine, Dance Spirit, Point, Dance Teacher, Dance Business Weekly, and the Dance Edit Newsletter. Our hosts are Courtney Escoyne, Margaret Fuhrer, Lydia Murray, and Cadence Neenan. Our music is by Celestine, with special thanks to Broadway Dance Center for helping us record those footfall sounds. Find out more about the Dance Edit and subscribe to our daily newsletter at thedanceedit.com. Thank you.